Hello, my name is Tom Jerichethel and I'm a neurologist at the University Hospital. And I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the ACHIEVE project, which is Canada's first stroke ambulance. So first off, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the impact of stroke. Stroke remains a leading cause of disability in adults. Uh, of the 60 million deaths or so that occur every year, stroke causes 10% of them. And the cost to Alberta is three to four hundred million dollars per year. So in Alberta, we've actually made a lot of progress with um, treating stroke. From 2005 to 2010, as indicated in this slide, uh, we went from having five centers in the province that could give clot-busting drugs for stroke to 18. So we've gone from about 30% of the geographic coverage of the province to closer to 80% of the geographic coverage. So really a lot of progress. And Alberta is definitely a leader in stroke systems in Canada and actually in the world as well. And we have the northern and southern telestroke systems that, that support this expansion of access uh, to care for patients living in rural and small urban areas. This slide's actually missing uh, high level, so my apologies to high level. But you, but you get the idea. If you, if you draw a one hour or one and a half hour radius uh, around each of these primary stroke centers, you can sort of get a sense of their catchment area in terms of you know, how close a patient has to be uh, to still be able to get relatively timely treatment. And what you see is there are these white areas in between. There are these areas that are not close to a primary stroke center and they're not close to Edmonton or Calgary. And it's gonna be the Drayton Valley, sorry, the Drayton Valley area, uh, even perhaps as close to, as Rocky Mountain House, uh, Edson, uh, Slave Lake, Athabasca, White Court, that whole region in there. And then also some areas uh, to the Northwest uh, that, are, uh, that are just west of Cold Lake or in between the Cold Lake area and Edmonton and Westlock. So these are areas, you know, that really don't have very good access to timely thrombolysis. What can we do about that? So there is a, a new technology available that uh, puts a CT scanner in an ambulance and telehealth technology and allows the treatment of patients sort of on the road in this specialized vehicles. These vehicles that they call mobile stroke units uh, or stroke ambulance is another way of referring to it. And a stroke ambulance, I mean, so I'll show you a couple of studies. There have been a few across the world without a, a tremendous number of patients treated, but there are increasing numbers now being studied. And what you find is when you, when you use this stroke ambulance technology as compared to the usual um, process of care, you actually drop the time from the 911 call to a therapy decision by a considerable amount. In fact, in, in this study, uh, which uh, is out of Germany, uh, they, uh, they dropped the alarm to therapy decision time from 76 minutes in the control group, which is actually very fast uh, anyway, but uh, to 35 minutes in those that receive therapy with a, a mobile stroke unit or a stroke ambulance. If you uh, compare those treated in a mobile stroke unit called the STEMO with patients enrolled in a quality improvement program in the United States called Get With The Guidelines. And what you find is in, a, in, a, in the STEMO, STEMO mobile stroke unit, a much higher proportion of people were treated earlier on in the course of the stroke than even in a, a, you know, a set of pretty high quality hospitals interested in quality improvement that were in the Get With The Guidelines registry. So it clearly does speed up treatment times. And again, here's another example of a situation where um, when you treat somebody in a mobile stroke unit, the alarm to IV TPA actually drops to 55 minutes compared to 94 minutes in control patients. We thought perhaps almost uniquely in Alberta, as, as opposed to some of the places that actually have these mobile stroke units, we felt there was a patient population that could benefit. A lot of these, in fact, all of the mobile stroke units across the world are being used in large urban centers, you know, the size of Edmonton or Calgary. And they might shave off, you know, maybe 20 minutes or a little bit more, as I've just showed you uh, in the slides, in terms of treatment times compared to the conventional care uh, that would have occurred in the city regardless. But the people that could really benefit from this are those that live in rural and small urban areas that are not, uh, it's actually predominantly rural, that are not serviced by a, a primary stroke center. So that brings us to the Stroke Ambulance Edmonton Project, which we've called the ACHIEVE Project, again with uh, 
very uh, creative use of, uh, of an acronym, but it's Ambulance Housed Ischemic Stroke Treatment with Intravenous Thrombolysis. To do this, it took a lot of planning. To plan it out, we assembled uh, eight working groups, uh, a steering committee, a vehicle specifications group, dispatch, assessment and treatment, a research group, technical operations, and, and a rural interactions group. And so hundreds of people contributed to this project from multiple areas of Alberta Health Services. We did a lot of process mapping, creating you know, diagrams of process in terms of what a, what we required to build the vehicle, but also the way the vehicle would act and behave when it was, you know, released into the system and how it would interact with other ambulances and incoming ambulance crews and primary stroke centers. The, the vehicle, we wanted to have a very specialized crew, an EMT driver, a paramedic, an RN, CT technologist, a stroke fellow who's a stroke neurologist in training who has the ability to read CT scans and do neurological exams if our technology fails us. He's the backup, he or she. And of course, the telestroke neurologist who's back in the University Hospital seeing the patient via video conference. Eventually, we would like this potentially to be part of the standard of care, so we wanted to integrate into existing systems. And uh, the vehicle need needed to have a CT scanner. We needed portable lab equipment in case we needed to inter interface with crews that hadn't been to a hospital yet video conferencing unit, a sophisticated system used by the U.S. Army called the LifeBot, a leveling system because you can't scan unless the vehicle is perfectly flat. Uh, we have a liquid suspension, a 14-foot compartment, and a, and a quad cab, a very spacious cab for these long trips. Uh, the vehicle will have TPA, numerous other medications used in stroke, um, EMS monitoring and treatment equipment, a ventilator, uh, a coagulant check as well, and a glucometer. So a whole bunch of equipment to support this vehicle and this crew. The idea is that we have a 250-kilometer dispatch region around Edmonton, and this is the region in which we may dispatch the stroke ambulance. Generally, we'd want a patient originating within this 250k buffer zone to make the driving distances reasonable, and that's actually what we've set up. And as you can imagine, there are a number of communities that are not close to a primary stroke center in this area that could potentially benefit. So here's a list of some of them uh, that I won't go Excuse me, I won't go through all of them, but uh, there's a number of communities that could be potential uh, target communities whereby we could improve the speed of treatment of their patients. So this is kind of a schematic of how the vehicle will, how it will be dispatched and what, what, it acti what its activities will be. So basically, the uh, physician on duty, so a patient comes to a local hospital with stroke symptoms, the physician on duty uh, attends and contacts the stroke expert via rapid and the, uh, the decision is made with RAPID and CCC, and we figure out whether the closest stroke ambulance rendezvous location beats transport to a, the closest primary stroke center. And we factor in door to needle times as well for that center to know whether we should dispatch the stroke ambulance. And if they, we do dispatch, what happens is you have the ambulance dispatched from the rural area that is incoming, and then the stroke ambulance is outgoing and dispatched from the UAH. And although we set up a tentative rendezvous location, in fact, the two crews can see each other on their, their GPS systems and can communicate with each other and, and actually can share a lot of information about the patient prior to actually meeting face-to-face. -face. And then uh, when they meet, the patient's moved into the stroke ambulance, a CT scan is done, and the images are sent via secure transmission process. Uh, by encrypted images to our impact servers where the telestroke neurologist can see the CT images and the telestroke neurologist can actually see the patient via video conference and the patient can see the telestroke neurologist from inside the CT ambulance based on screens and cameras that are available. And so this was the actual idea that we envisioned. And this is an idea of how you know the stroke ambulance will change some of the existing processes. This is a very simple schematic because the exact details of uh, some of the uh, the dispatch work is still being worked out uh, because we're looking at province-wide standards that would also work for stroke ambulance. So, you know, there'll be an EMS crew um, as part of the ERA project that a lot of you will be familiar with. If a, the LAM score performed by the pre-hospital crew is greater than or equal to four, then the, the crew will actually call RAPID and Telestroke will be activated. And then we may in that situation dispatch the patient, divert them away from a primary stroke center, because uh, the LAMS greater than or equal to four means that the patient has a high risk of having a large vessel occlusion. 
and who might not benefit from TPA as much, but may need endovascular therapy only available in Edmonton or Calgary. So when the lambs is greater than four, we may, we may, may get a call from the crew, uh, and we'll figure out a transport method into Edmonton. But this might now involve stroke ambulance. It's one of the assets we can use in addition to STARS and provincial flight and ground crew to get the patient to Edmonton. Um, if a patient presents to a primary stroke center, emergency department, um, the usual processes of care will, will continue. Um, and if they, if they come to a non-primary stroke center emergency department, we're wanting them, the non-primary stroke center to call rapid as well for directions because in many cases, during operational hours of the stroke ambulance, which is 8 to 4, we may be able to um, divert the patient away from a primary stroke center and move them towards Edmonton and treat them on the road with the stroke ambulance. So stroke ambulance can be considered one of the assets we use to actually get the patient uh, to Edmonton and in the same way or at the same time give them actual treatment on the road. Why would we do this? We're talking about expensive technology. You know, the whole stroke ambulance project is funded by philanthropy and it costs about $3.3 million and we've offset about 600000 of that from peer-reviewed grant funding. Uh, so it's expensive. Um, the vehicle itself is closer to about a million dollars, uh, but the project itself with all the salaries and everything is what adds up for cost. Well, the reason we might do it is the average stroke patient uh, has about a million dollar lifetime cost to the health system. So if you treat 100 patients with TPA, uh, we often cure about 12, and we could potentially produce a cost avoidance of about 12, 12 million for every 100 patients treated. Uh, and a one-year cost avoidance of about 960,000 patients, uh, sorry, $960,000. All right, so we use this to fund, to, to actually build a rationale for the project in the first place uh, because TPA is highly cost-effective. But we've incorporated a detailed cost-effectiveness analysis into the project. So it's a system-wide pre-post analysis with administrative data sets uh, involving an internationally recognized expert in health technology assessment, Dr. McCabe. We'll be looking at death, disability, and cost effectiveness. We'll be looking at multiple health system databases, as well as having prospective databases uh, and prospective assessments, for example, caregiver burden, how much money could this vehicle save society in general, as well as the, the payer, the healthcare system. And guess what? It's all built now. So the vehicle took a while, uh, but it is built, and it's, it's now fully functional, and it has been dispatched. It went live February 7th. And uh, it is off to a bit of a slow start, but has been dispatched a number of times and has treated a number of patients with IV TPA already. The vehicle is operational. Um, I think it's probably one of the world's best in terms of how it's designed and its functionality and its, its applicability to the north, uh, northern climate. So it is Canada's first stroke ambulance and the world's first stroke ambulance with a rural application. And uh, I think that pretty much covers all I want you as a you know, a primary stroke center or a non-primary stroke center a physician or health practitioner to know about the stroke ambulance. Just know that it is an option. Uh, for now, we, we have you call RAPID to figure out, you know, whether we should send your patient to a primary stroke center or whether we should dispatch the stroke ambulance to treat them and then also get them moving towards Edmonton. I think Alberta has been a leader in stroke care for a while and really this is the latest technology we have available to, t to treat stroke and we're going to be carefully evaluating it and making a case to the health system you know, in terms of how the vehicle should be used in the future and where it fits into the current stroke system.